So uh, the last presentation of uh, the open infra days here today is going to be about open source networking in a modern data center. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, how you can leverage open source routing to implement a spine and lead architecture in a modern data center, trying to avoid using layer two networking and use as much layer three networking, um, overcoming the shortcomings of layer two networking with layer three network. What's on the agenda? First, I want to talk about a little bit about OpenStack DCN deployment architectures. DCN stands for Distributed Compute Node. It's an architecture where you deploy OpenStack um, with compute nodes spread around across uh, different data centers. So imagine uh, a deployment where your compute nodes are running in Chicago, in New York, and uh, perhaps Miami, and then your control plane runs in, in Chicago. That's that's a classical DCN deployment architecture where you try to get your workloads as closest to the clients or, or to, to where the requests are coming in. Uh, then I wanted to briefly touch about for the gateway protocol BGP. Uh, that's what we're going to use to implement uh, dynamic routing in, in the data center. And then two other uh, really useful protocols, uh, BFD, Bidirectional forwarding detection, uh, a very useful helper for uh, BGP, in this case, uh, helping to uh, quickly remove uh, routes when there's link failure. And then we have equal cost multipath, a very useful uh, protocol in the Linux kernel that allows to install uh, multiple routes in the route table with the same destination, but a different next hop. And thanks to that, you can do things like load balancing across those next hops. First, let's talk about uh, how uh, you do implement a, 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 a control plane um, in a distributed fashion and what a road to a truly distributed control plane looks like in, in an open stack environment. So first we're starting with a layer two control plane. Um, all of our controller machines in OpenStack, which run the uh, control plane services, are collocated in one layer two network. So you can't really spread those around. You can't distribute them, right? They're bound by uh, that layer two network. A little bit of an evolution from that is uh, you try to distribute the layer two control plane network with the helpers, help of uh, tunneling protocols. So you could potentially stretch that layer two control plane network and start distributing a control plane across you know, geographically or, or in your region uh, and, and, and benefit from you know, having uh, not a single point of failure in that one layer two domain. And then going from there, once we switch to layer three, we open up a bit more possibilities for distributing that control plane. And we'll talk about how the routing protocols I just mentioned aid in that. So typical, this, this is the typical DCN environment today on OpenStack. Uh, on the uh, left-hand side here, you have the first rack with the purple uh, squares where we have all the controllers sitting on the same layer to network. Um, that rack is a single point of failure, right? Uh, if you lose this rack, you just lost your control plane. Your workloads uh, may be running on rack two and rack three, the middle one and the one on the right hand side. It might be unaffected, but when you lose your control plane, you lose the ability to create new workloads, uh, pause new workloads. When I say workloads, those are virtual machines typically. Add new storage, uh, add new virtual networks. Your, your ability to control your uh, data center is gone. So single point of failure, uh, and that's mainly due to that layer two boundary imposed uh, uh, by uh, our control plane sitting on that one uh, broadcast domain. You can still distribute your workloads, right? We have two other racks. Uh, this is our data plane with the, the blue squares. So we can still do that. That's okay. Uh, but again, we're focusing on the control plane being the single point of failure in this architecture. Now, take it a step further. 
Let's try and distribute that control plane, right? What does it take to distribute it? Since the control plane is really bound by the layer two, well, let's stretch that layer through across, across the three racks. So now you have that pink bubble present in each of the three, each of the three racks. There's a controller sitting in each of the three racks. Um, but the way to make it happen is since the implementation relies on layer two, there is networking protocols there that are relying on, on the broadcast uh, transmission. So we have to stretch that layer through across those three racks. So we have that benefit of actually distributing the control plane across the three racks, but there's a additional technical complexity involved here in that some third party technology has to implement layer two tunneling to, sp to spread that layer two broadcast domain across the three racks. Uh, the, the data plane remains the same. Uh, you can still place your workloads across the three racks. Uh, so we still have a distributed data plane. Slightly better, right? Uh, complex, but it gives you a distributed control plane. Now, the target version, right? This is where I think everyone should go in the data center. We're distributed the control plane. We're stopping to relying on things like layer two tunneling. Instead, we're just ditching that layer two completely in the control plane, right? And in order to do that, you have to use some helpers. And that helper here is a routing protocol, dynamic routing protocol, BGP, which is used to advertise the availability of the active control plane machines into your upstream network. And in this case, the upstream network are the spine one and spine two switches um, into which all of those three racks are wide. Um, so, what I was gonna say, okay. <laughs> so same thing with the data plane, uh, still benefiting from uh, uh, using uh, distributed uh, workloads on the data plane. But there's one extra thing here, right? Now that we have BGP that is able to advertise the availability of uh, the control plane machines, we can also use BGP to advertise the workloads that are running in your data plane. So imagine you have a new virtual machine coming up and uh, when that machine comes up, uh, the, there's a, a software router that is running on the compute node where that uh, virtual machine is running. And as soon as that virtual machine is up, it's IP address uh, is advertised using a host route up to your uh, switching fabric uh, to the spine and then redistribute it from there, either to your corporate network or straight up to the internet if that is a public network. So let's talk about the, the distributed control plane and, and how it works. So we no longer have the boundary of the layer two network. Uh, each of these racks, uh, Rack number one, rack number two, rack number three is its own layer, layer two domain. There is no layer two communication between those two racks. So we're reducing the size of potential broadcast storms. We're reducing uh, the surface attack as well, right? We're containing that traffic into that one particular rack. And this is especially important uh, when it comes to the control plane. Uh, where, um, where we're running our APIs for public APIs or internal APIs in OpenStack. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a change in how this works from the previous version of that architecture. Um, we are advertising virtual IP addresses, uh, much like previously. Previously, we used VRRP to advertise an IP address. VRRP is a layer two protocol that relies on broadcast. Now, instead of doing that using VRRP, uh, we are assigning those VIP addresses to a loopback IP address running on the controller. And from there, there's a routing process that picks out that IP address uh, once it's available and redistributes that and uh, pushes it out, uh, advertises it out to the rest of the network. Control plane, same thing. Um, I'm sorry, data plane, same thing. We have, instead of uh, virtual IP addresses, which uh, advertise the availability of APIs, uh, we have virtual machines that are being booted up uh, 
daily, right? In daily operations, you boot up, spin up virtual machines, bring them down. And as soon as those get booted up, the availability of the IP addresses that are used by those VMs is advertised using BGP up to the rest of the network. Uh, now, we'll talk about the pieces that actually make it happen a little bit more in detail. So what happens in detail on your layer three data plane? Uh, so the first thing that happens, you have, there's a little, if you're familiar how OpenStack works, there's provided bridges which handle VM networking. Uh, typically those provided bridges have physical NICs assigned to them. So you have a bridge, you have one NIC, and when the VMs get booted, they get added uh, with an interface to that bridge. And that's how the traffic makes it in and out. It's kind of simple, right? Um, we're having a little bit of a different scenario here because the bridges where the VMs get booted up and get attached don't have any physical NICs. The reason for doing that is that uh, you want to redistribute that uh, the traffic that is being uh, the inbound and outbound traffic from these VMs. You want to make that available through BGP. So the first thing that had to happen for the traffic processing, um, in order for that bridge to respond to any kind of a traffic, well, you have to enable proxy ARP. What, what is proxy ARP? For IPv4 traffic, proxy ARP is a simple piece of technology that just says respond to ARP requests on that given network. Similar idea for IPv6 traffic, uh, where uh, in IPv6 we don't have ARP anymore, we have NDP. NDP stands for Network Discovery Protocol. You enable that uh, proxy NDP on that given bridge, and um, uh, the kernel, the Linux kernel, now can answer to NDP requests much like it answers to uh, ARP requests. What happens when a new VM boots up? Uh, credit goes to this gentleman, Darren, for this drawing. I love it. <laughs> new virtual machine comes up, right? There's a piece of software called OVN BGP agent. The OVN BGP agent interacts with the Linux kernel. It also interacts with uh, the OVN southbound database where it listens for events. Um, and, and then it also interacts with a routing process called FRR. FRR is a software router, which I'll describe a bit in more detail. So what happens first? Virtual machine comes up, the OVN BGP agent is listening for events in the southbound OVN database. So what, what is OVN agent going to find out from that database when the VM boots up? The most important piece is what IP address that VM uses. So now, now that the OVN BGP agent knows that there's a new VM and a new IP, it, it really needs to point it to a bridge. And uh, the way to do that is we're using kernel uh, networking, uh, using uh, IP rules, we're directing traffic that is destined uh, to that VM to that given bridge. And that is specifically for ingress traffic, right? If you create an IP rule that says from any to that VM 10, 0, 20, 30, go to that bridge, then if that traffic is arriving through BGP over some one of the BGP links, which is not tied to that bridge, we're effectively redirecting that traffic to that bridge. Um, then what happens, right? That VM comes up uh, and we want to advertise the availability of that VM's uh, IP address in, in our BGP enabled network. So the last piece in that transaction is that um, the OVN BGP agent uh, will uh, redistribute that route into uh, into BGP by bringing up uh, bringing up a, a interface on a loopback, which gets uh, redistributed into that router routing process. Agent traffic is a little bit different, right? Uh, we have the same scenario, right? We have a bridge. Uh, where we want to direct that traffic to, and that bridge has to push the traffic out for that particular VM. So uh, when that VM boots, um, the OVN BGP agent will also um, pick up the MAC address of, of that VM. It will look up the flow in the OVN flow table, and it will rewrite the destination of uh, uh, of packets that are arriving from that given VM, given that particular flow, to the MAC address of the bridge. And guess, guess what we did just in the previous step? We enabled proxy ARP on that bridge 
So if there's a ARC request or NDP request uh, testing for that bridge, uh, and, and thanks to doing that, now when that VM is trying to look for its gateway, right? It's just trying to send the traffic out. So it's sending our request for a dot one address and it's trying to look up, you know, where where is our what MAC address is our dot one address, which is my gateway. That bridge, thanks to that destination MAC being overwritten for that given flow, will respond with that. How is that useful, right? Uh, now that the traffic has actually reached the bridge and the bridge is able to respond with a ARP, ARP request and a network discovery protocol request for V6, we can use the kernel's routing table to forward that traffic out. So now we got that traffic on that bridge and uh, there's routes being advertised over BGP and installed in the routing table. And from now, from there, that traffic can be actively forwarded using the routes in the routing table to its final destination. So that's how egress traffic processing works when you're using BGP with OpenStack. What makes this all possible, right? Uh, there's, a, there's one core piece here. Of course, OpenStack is at, is at the core here, but um, the addition to OpenStack that makes it all possible is an open source routing daemon called FRR. FRR stands for free, free range routing. Um, it's a it's a very interesting project. Uh, I've learned most of the dynamic routing protocols using its predecessor, uh, which was called Quaha. Uh, and um, you will find references to zebras and quagas uh, still in FRR if you dig it. Uh, for example, uh, the daemon that takes care of installing the routes in the route table is co still called zebra. Uh, in FRI. So about three years ago, maybe four years ago, a uh, few, few smart people decided to resurrect Quagga. Quagga existed for many, many years, more than 20 years or so. They forked it and they actively continued the development that was started many years ago. Um, Quagga, I'm oh, sorry, FRI routing supports many different routing protocols, including OSPF, including RIP, even version one, version two. Um, it supports OSPF v3 as well. It can do OSPF over v6. And it's a really good learning tool for, for routing protocols. The three of interest here for, for this uh, deployment uh, of OpenStack are BGP, we already talked about it, ECMP, and BFD. All those three protocols are implemented in Quagga um, and FR routing. Um, and we can benefit from using those to implement a spine and leaf architecture in our data center. Uh, the way that FRR is implemented on OpenStack these days is uh, it's supported by Triple O. Uh, so you can deploy router instances that are created using containers on your compute nodes, on your uh, uh, controller nodes, and also on your network nodes. So Anywhere where a workload, a data plane workload like a VM or uh, API from the control plane can be advertised, that's where you can run a, uh, an FRR container. Um, worth also mentioning, um, FRR will run on pretty much any Linux flavor, probably, uh, and majority of the BSD system that systems out there. Let's talk about a little bit of about the acronyms that we used in this presentation. Uh, BGP, BGP is a border, it's a border gateway protocol. It's a external uh, gateway protocol. Uh, it is a distance vector routing protocol where routing decisions are made not based on the amount of hops. Like when you do a trace route, sometimes you see like 20 hops, right? BGP doesn't look at the amount of hops that uh, you would take to reach a destination, it actually considers how many autonomous systems, which are usually large scale networks, imagine Comcast, imagine Red Hat, imagine AT&T, how many of these networks do you have to traverse to get to that destination? Uh, so this is called the AS path, autonomous system path. Every BGP router is assigned to a given autonomous system. So 
Uh, in this case, we're looking at how many autonomous systems do we have to traverse to get to get to the destination there of choice. BGP has been the, the routing protocol of choice in spinal leaf technology topologies uh, for major reason is really because of its scale, right? If we want to implement an infinitely scalable data center, we shall pick a routing protocol that can scale to that to the whole planet. And that is BGP today. Uh, BGP is used to route traffic between all the continents, all the countries, and all the internet service providers within a country. That is BGP. Uh, the, the route tables, sizes that BGP handles today are, I believe, over a million routes. Uh, so, you know, BGP has enough power in it, it's, it's architected enough to scale to that level. BFD, uh, interesting protocol. Uh, BGP has been around for about 30 or 40 years now, since the inception of internet. Uh, well, maybe not that, it came right after. Uh, but BGP brings in some legacy luggage with it. Uh, and one of those is uh, something called a hold time. Hold time is, is basically a time in which a BGP router will drop the routes, learn from a peer after not hearing back from it. So it sends a keep alive. And let's say you've set the hold time to, to three minutes, right? It will wait up to three minutes from a missed uh, keep alive packet for removing the route. So if that peer is really down, things could get pretty dodgy, right? You're sending that traffic to an absolute black hole. And the lowest that you can configure uh, a BGP timer uh, hold time is three seconds, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in modern internet, right? Three seconds is a massive loss. You can lose a lot of packets in, in three seconds. Uh, so BFD comes in, uh, BFD does much, much more aggressive monitoring uh, of the link. Uh, it can do it on a sub millis, not a sub millisecond, sub seconds, so milliseconds uh, time intervals. And instead of waiting for that whole time to expire, it will actually take that session right down and remove the routes from the route table. Now, where that comes really useful is when it is integrated with the next protocol that I'm going to talk about. Because what, what is it good if you take out all the routes from the route table if there isn't another route to get to the destination that you want to go to? And that's where ECMP comes in, right? We have multiple routes in our route table. They're destined for the same network, same destination. They use different hops. And with the help of BFD, that can, that, that can instantly just withdraw the routes which are uh, coming from a peer that just went down, ECMP allows you to right away take over, right? There's another route in the route table, uh, the old routes are withdrawn, and, and the new routes are being considered right away. Uh, moreover, in scenario where you're using ECMP, you can also use round robin to balance your existing routes, right? So, so if we're looking at implementing a layer three data center without the need to use of protocols like bonding, using static lags, maybe LACP, multi-chassis lags, we can replace a lot of that functionality that is implemented on the switches with ECMP and specifically BFD, right? So we're implementing redund link redundancy, link aggregation, all using, um, so all using a software provided by FRR uh, and these protocols that enable it, uh, enable that for you. Uh, I think that's pretty impressive because it allows you, it allows you to uh, use pretty much very cheap switches, right? You don't have to invest in uh, multi-chassis lags, which are, I've had all bad luck with multi-chassis lags in my life, uh, uh, like replicating ARPs to the other switch and um, it's it's just, just asking for trouble. So by adding more layer three, uh, links to your server, you can actually get around this and implement highly available and link hold, hold tolerance um, um, in your data center. 
A few links here for references. Oh, Chris is going to ask a question right now. <laughs> so, is there like a performance difference between the ECMP and like the LACP from like the because you 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 know in both of these or in lack uh, there is a there is a hit. So that's you're asking the right question, right? EMP since it allows these sub second recoveries from from link failures. It's a little bit resource intense, right? So it will actually throw up some CPU by doing those keep alive instead of every three seconds, like BGP would, it would do it every few milliseconds, right? So there is, there is an overhead that needs to be accommodated when you're backing out the hardware for your data center, because that overhead will be spent on the compute node, on the controller, on the network node, where FRR runs with BFP. I wouldn't say that there's a like a performance impact, but there is an additional consideration for the resources that will be consumed by that software rather where BFD runs. And if we're aiming for something like, you know, LSP is pretty good, uh, actually it's pretty great uh, for doing uh, recoveries. You know, when the link goes down, you just don't even see a packet blip. If you're running a ping, right? And and since we're aiming to do the same thing with BMD, those timers in BMD have to be clocked pretty low. That interval should be as low as possible. And all of that translates into extra CPU settings. With the advent of modern hardware, though, uh, it's easier and easier to have 128 cores on a server. Uh, so that really helps. Uh, does that answer your question, Chris? Perfect. Thank you. Where's the demo? <laughs> the demo is in the lab. <laughs> and we're not in the lab. <laughs> great, some great pointers here in, uh, in the references. Uh, the first one is a blog that uh, Louis Thomas Bolivar writes. He's an excellent software engineer. Um, the brain behind the OVN BGP agent. Uh, I, I really enjoy reading his entries. Uh, uh, highly recommend you do that too. The second article is about introduction of the features that I talked about uh, with uh, with BGP in Red Hat OpenStack 17. Um, that's a good one to read. Uh, and the last one is a, is a link to uh, the deployment guide for installing this. So you can pick that up uh, in uh, Red Hat OpenStack. Uh, platform version 17.1, install that in the lab, play around with it. Uh, I am in the process of doing that, and that's why demo is in the lab. Any questions for me? I knew it. That's a boring networking presentation for the last day. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Uh, So, so actually, mm -hmm. please. It, um, as much as I'd love to try this, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around what it would what it would take to migrate to this technology from an existing production cloud. Yeah. Is that like nearly impossible? Or <laughs> you would have to build uh, a new environment. Yeah. Uh, I don't like migrating to this in like a staggered fashion might be a little too difficult, especially because as soon as you want the compute node to work in this architecture, you have to disconnect disconnect the NICs of your provider bridges, which means breaking the networking for all your VMs, right? So downtime, 100%, there's just a little way that I can think about how to make a smooth transition into this environment. Maybe do it by region, right? Like migrate your VMs, convert that stack, migrate your VMs back. Uh, also, what's what's worth mentioning is that the data plane and the control plane functionality, those those can be decoupled each other, right? You don't have to use BGP in your control plane and your data plane. You can run that only to advertise your control plane VIPs, your public, your internal API VIPs or you can use it only to advertise uh, your VMs uh, 
IP. So those those two can be the couple. It means that if you want to take the benefit of distributed control plane, you can do it that independent without yeah. disturbing it, right? And that's one of the key benefits which a lot of customers are going towards is distributed control. So we can put it on different tracks, the controllers and all those things yeah. can be different geolocations and things like that. Right. So, so that that's a big advantage for some of the customers we're talking about. So you guys run multiple availability. Yeah. Like you, you so where do you run your controllers today? They're on two of the AZs, but they're all the same L2. Exactly. I mean, this this is what we're trying to target here primarily, is get those controllers out of that one AZ and spread them around multiple racks. Um, and it's, to me, I mean, that that is, the obvious choice, right? That that's what people wanted to do with OpenStack for a long time, but uh, because of the RRP, right? And 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 pacemakers very close relationship with it, you weren't able to do that. You get HA for control plane, uh geo HA to say, right? Without yeah. without adding additional number of control. You have three controllers, you can still achieve geo edge at the top. Yeah. So. Great. Thank you very much.